And now we're being joined by Robert Pstel, former NATO official, to discuss some of these uh, topics, of course, uh, defense, but also uh, what has been happening over the weekend during the uh, NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, good morning, sir. Delighted to have you with us. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. So let's start with this uh, NATO gathering. Actually, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly is uh, separate from NATO proper, right? But um, what has been established? What, what do we know? Well, you, you're correct. I mean, it is it is an independent body because, of course, it's um, uh, it's attended by independent uh, parliamentarians. You know, the governments cannot tell the government uh, the, the parliamentarians what to say, what to do, and so on. The, that's even more true of, of NATO, but as an organization. But it is important because, first of all, I mean, this gathering brings together, I understand, uh, close to 300 um, delegates uh, from all NATO. Now, 32 countries of so Sweden attend, Swedish parliamentarians attend for, for the first time as full members, mm -hmm. uh, but also about 100 um, partner parliamentarians for partner countries. Uh, and it is an important place where lots of ideas can be discussed uh in a much more let's say uh liberal from the point of view you know uh, of discussion setting uh, it's not by chance that um, there's a reason why in the past for example nato parliamentary assembly has come up with various ideas uh, which then uh, subsequently were, were taken up by by the governments for example in the past that was the case with partnership for peace um, there is always uh, an opportunity, and this was the case this morning with the Secretary General attending, uh, to have a much more um, open debate at some of the trickiest issues. And these are to do with Ukraine, both the war, but also the future of Ukraine in NATO, uh, but also let's, let's call it broadly the state of preparedness of NATO in terms of collective defense uh, for uh, you know, facing up the challenges which, which is facing, and they are very serious. And all the other topics, which include many, I mean, these are to do with global partnerships, to do with uh, technology, to do with uh, situation in different regions. Uh, and I always said when I worked in NATO, uh, particularly uh, with, um, with the Secretary General, including this one, in Stoltenberg that I always, uh, from the point of view of, for example, the media and the public, I thought that these sessions were by far the most interesting because, you know, the parliamentarian asked different questions and they will not take some sort of evasive answers. Um, of answers. So it, this session showed uh, that 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 debating and, and the public uh, public role of the Parliamentary Assembly is, is still valuable. I just wish more people would actually follow this. I, I checked how many people watched the uh, Q&A session on YouTube. Hmm. Uh, it, there could be more, but there is an opportunity, I'm sure, to watch it, Vaxana, which I would strongly recommend. And that's why we bring, let's say, now the most important parts of this, what you mentioned. Now, um, I want to pause here also and ask about what um, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg have men has mentioned today. He mentioned that NATO's um, role in coordinating our training institutional structure for the support is a very much vital and that there is a need for a change of structure um, when it comes to support for Ukraine and it has to be a substantial one. One. But what do you think he means by that? And how likely is it uh, uh, really for NATO to introduce these? Well, personally, I think it's absolutely fundamental because the time has come uh, to bring a lot of strands uh, which are there, which are essential when it comes to external Western, essentially, policy um, uh, of, of assisting Ukraine uh, together within, of course, you know, in, in, in respect of the, of the mandate of individual institutions. And this is the issue. So at the moment, when you look at the uh, military defense uh, forms of support, we have the so-called Rammstein Group, which provides, provides if you like, a political um, a chapeau, as the French say, uh, to this effort. So countries come together, and it's not just NATO countries. That's important because for some countries, um, you know, from outside of NATO, it's more convenient uh, politically, if you like, to have it done outside the NATO framework. That's fine. But then you have the actual implementation phase. And uh, I think Secretary General himself mentioned the, the, the role of the central Wiesbaden, uh, which is you know, it's it's kind of a bit complicated for some people, and but this is the way NATO works. You have the NATO's commander, uh, who is uh, both the, the operational commander of NATO's or Sakir, but he's double-hatted. He's always an American general admiral. That's the case today with General Cavoli, and he's also a commander of the U.S. forces in Europe. And 
that's kind of worked so far in terms of actually implementing what has been agreed. But this is tricky. So Secretary General has been promoting this idea, which I, I think is a very good idea. And there have been some support from it from uh, NATO countries. So at least in principle, the ministers uh, a month or two ago have agreed that this is the direction to take, uh, which is that NATO should if you like, take over the responsibilities when it comes to coordination of this implementation phase. And we're not just talking about uh, ammunition, uh, uh, weapon system, which is crucial, supplies off, but also when it comes to uh, training. So uh, there are other elements on the table. And one of the things which Secretary General, let's not forget, he, he was, uh, he's a former finance minister, he understands very well the importance of resources, he's also been advocating that that greater role that NATO should play in coordinating uh, this support, long-term support, by the way, should come uh, with uh, some specially allocated resources. And that's what the debate is about. It's not as if every, not everything has been agreed. Countries have some uh, hesitations for a variety of reasons. So addressing the parliamentarian, in a way, I think the Secretary General used the opportunity to, uh, to promote uh, the topic to promote the, 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 the ideas which are on the table but have not been agreed by the governments yet. Uh, right, sir, and this is what I wanted to, to ask you about. Uh, Poland currently spends around 4% of its GDP on defense, which is uh, uh, among the highest um, in Europe, and it has, it has been urging other countries to at least spend around three or the, the sort of the minimum two. So what is happening on that uh, front, and can we, uh, can we count on, on our allies uh, to increase the defense spending? <clears throat> well, the, the picture is mixed. I mean, there's more good elements in the picture because there's no question that the uh, situation has improved dramatically, even in the last few years. You have countries which were pretty far away from the uh, pledge uh, they made, um, you know, in 2014, and now they are either meeting this or they're very close by. That's the good news. So in total, that simply means that Europeans uh, have been providing much more uh, to, uh, to the uh, you know, to, to, to not, there's no common budget, but, you know, to, if you want to improve the capabilities, if you want to resource uh, all the defense plans, you need, you need money for this. But that is unfortunately not, uh, not enough because there's still a number of countries that have not reached the 2% and they're quite far away from this. And that includes some G7 members, so the most prosperous and richest countries, such as Italy, for example, or Canada. And third issue is that the two percent agreed as a, as a kind of benchmark in, uh, in in Wales at the summit in 2014. That's frankly no longer good enough, uh, uh, because uh, you know uh, we are in a situation where some I argue is just as dangerous or even more dangerous for, for certain reasons than in the Cold War. And in the Cold War, the frontier states, they are doing their bit. And as you can see today, uh, it's Poland, but it's also the Baltic countries, Sweden, Finland, they are spending uh, a lot of money. But the countries further away, well, they should spend more. And in the Cold War, they spend about 3%. This is not the case. And so this here, the solidarity is lacking. And without the financial um, commitments, it would be difficult, it's, if not impossible, to do all the things that everybody agrees that needs to be done. How do you ramp up the industrial production? Well, all this have to be uh, placed with the defense companies. How do you I I increase the size? Yes, the size, mass matters as well, of the armed forces. How do you invest in, you know, expensively, et cetera? So you need the money for this. So uh, that's where we are with this, uh, with this picture. It's a mixed one. There are reasons to say good, progress achieved, but there are also reasons to say uh, this solidarity is, is not sufficient and the countries should look themselves in the mirror uh, and say we need to do, we should be doing more, and the frontier states in particular have the right uh, to, to press them very hard on this because this is ultimately what, what matters most, the actual abilities and capabilities uh, for collective defense, for supporting Ukraine, and doing all the other projects which are important for international security. And uh, I feel like here some countries when looking um, now at the mirror might find some difficult truths that they will have to tackle. Now a situation in Poland is slightly different or at least it seems so. I'm talking now about the recent project of Eastern Shield program that um, well experts have outlined um, that this how this project should ideally look but um, if we are looking at this from a broader perspective if you could perhaps now unpack this for our viewers 
viewers, what are the primary goals of this new Eastern Shield program and how does it aim to enhance Poland defence capabilities as well as now how does it align with NATO's broader strategy for NATO's eastern flank? Well, the projects, I mean, the, there is, a, if you like, a proliferation of projects, and uh, it's not surprising that the, the general public may feel slightly confused. But the objective is is, is, is extremely simple. Uh, you know, uh, everybody wants to have the highest possible level of security. We live in the times where, you know, the predators such as Russia are, are roaming. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, now the sky is in the land of Ukraine, and they are opening, threatening other countries. There's hybrid operations. You mentioned some of them in your program before. Um, uh, but you know, uh, the, so there are many elements uh, of 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 the of the security, if you like, uh, instruments, uh, tools that that I needed. But one of them, of course, the most uh, perhaps urgent ones, uh, is is to protect your own skies, the airspace. So, of course, you have uh, various um, uh, various elements, national capabilities. You have, in the case of Poland, Baltic states, um, and a few other countries, the presence of allies, including in the air. Uh, are there are air policing functions. There are reconnaissance planes flying, and there are certain air defense uh, systems such as patriots and so on. But the problem is that. Everybody knows that's not a secret. It's not enough of them. So the countries need to uh, purchase more. And this is what these projects are about. It's about getting the best combination at the best possible price. And the principle is simple. When the countries get together, they usually get uh, you know, better conditions, if you like. So they pay more, it's better for the taxpayer. And they may also achieve interoperability, which is important in terms of ultimately operating. In the end, in NATO, all the systems are connected. But uh, this is not as simple as it sounds, because countries are also at different levels of procurement. And in the case of country like Poland, who has been, let's say, more advanced in terms of its level of ambition, it has a number of projects uh, already, for example, the Polish-British projects. It has bought some uh, some some important assistance from US, etc. So it is not as easy to just say, well, we just participate in any projects uh, and everything will kind of, you know, it's not like a sort of it's not as simple as the Lego. So uh, a care has to be uh, taken uh, to uh, to um, uh, to participate, to support uh, this very valuable uh, cooperation um, efforts, but in a manner which, of course, makes sense from the point of view in which countries find themselves in terms of their own uh, procurement investment plans. And that's what this is about. So the details may be confusing, but I think the general picture, the general goal is very simple. It's about making sure that our skies uh, are, are safe and they are protected in the best possible manner. And on this note, uh, the news have just surfaced that um, six NATO countries uh, plan to create a so-called drone wall. And these countries include Finland, Norway, Poland and the Baltic states. I believe that is to um, ensure the safety of, of airspace, as you just uh, pointed out. Uh, so is it possible for some countries to sort of uh, act on their own within the uh, broader NATO alliance, but just sort of, you know, uh, we create smaller groups, let's say, of, of, of countries which are more proactive, especially those on the eastern flank? Well, absolutely. I mean, in a way, this is this is how it works. There's nothing wrong with countries getting together if they're getting together for the positive uh, reasons. And because, as I mentioned, one one issue is, uh, is, 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 is like a commercial aspect, which is uh, which is to get the best price. Uh, and then it's a question of financing itself. So if there are funds, to put it you know, very simply, if there are funds available, for example, uh, you know, within a broad range of European Union um, you know, uh, tools, then uh, by all means, if countries, if they're members of the of, of, of European Union, that should use them. Uh, but then, as I said, it's 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 in the end, all those systems have to be uh, when they are acquired, when you know there's training involved, uh, and, and countries can help each other, and of course. You know, geography matters. It makes more sense for the countries who are closer together uh, geographically, and basically they, they face a similar comparable level of threat. So they are part of, for example, um, you know, um, the same uh, uh, specific elements of, of the defense plans. 
but all this still has to be plugged in to a bigger, uh, bigger, if you like, um, inner body, which is which is that uh, which NATO has uh, has a key say because it's NATO that is responsible for the collective defense of its member states, and that's why we have the NATO agreed plans. They are so-called regional plans with lots of specific roles assigned to countries to specific units. Uh, there are command structures which are responsible uh, for, uh, you know, uh, different, um, each, everybody has a task, to put it simply, you know, and again, that goes for the air, for the land, for the Navy, and uh, for the cyber domain, by the way, and so on. So this is, this is the challenge, but this is exactly the job of the ministers of defense of each country, uh, NATO country, new country, and this is the job that in which they should be supported, ideally by the ministers of finance uh, and other people who can contribute to this effort to make the security instruments available uh, by far the most uh, modern and the most applicable to the challenges that, uh, that we're facing today. But one thing is certain here that it is a definitely a pressing issue. And in Suma now the discussion, like you mentioned, um, revolves around the funds to be allocated where and when, as we know that time is of the essence here, especially as the threat coming from Russia is looming over eastern uh, flank of NATO. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us and thank you for your insights.